Are you a fan of hot hatches? Are you looking for the ultimate hot hatch in America? And do you perhaps think that the Volkswagen Golf R and the Honda Civic Type R are simultaneously too slow and a little bit too boy racer at the same time? Well, there's a Mercedes-Benz GLA 45 for you. Now, Mercedes would like you to call the GLA a subcompact crossover. Theoretically, this could compete with the likes of the Range Rover Evoque, but we actually have less ground clearance in this than in the Volkswagen Golf. So in my mind, the GLA is definitely a hot hatch, a very, very hot hatch with over 300 horsepower if you're looking at the GLA 35 and 382 as we're taking a look at today. But it will cost you significantly more than those other options I just mentioned. The GLA 35 starts over $47,000. This one right here starts at $54,500. If you live outside the United States, you have access to an even hotter AMG hatch, the A45S hatch. That will give you 416 horsepower out of basically the same 2-liter turbo with a decent number of tweaks, and that really is the absolute ultimate worldwide hot hatch. But it's not available in the United States. Here, we just get the GLA. It seems that Mercedes is on a mission to design a vehicle for absolutely everybody. So they have basically four base models in the US, the A-Class, the CLA, the GLA, and the GLB. The GLB is the vehicle for you if you want a small crossover with three tiny rows. The GLA is the vehicle for you if you want a raised hatchback, a very slightly raised hatchback with just two rows. A CLA is for you if you want a sleek and sexy four-door vehicle. And the A-Class is for you if you want a slightly smaller traditional Mercedes sedan. The big thing to know is that all four of these vehicles have AMG versions available, although not all the same AMG versions in each of these four entries, and there is a ton of price overlap in the Mercedes lineup. As you'd expect out of a vehicle that's trying to exist in a world between the hot hatch and the hot small crossover, we have a bit of body cladding around the wheel wells and some really tiny roof rails. But if you don't let those little styling cues fool you, the rest of this is certainly very hot hatch-like, and I don't think that's a problem at all. At 173.6 inches long, this is on the small side for the subcompact luxury crossover segment if that's where you want to position this. This is about the same size as the Jaguar E-Pace, about one and a half inches longer than a Range Rover Evoque, but significantly nine inches shorter than the Mercedes-Benz GLB. If you want a small Mercedes that's not too much more expensive than most versions of the GLA, there is the GLB. It is styled a bit more like the Mercedes-Benz GLS, and it has a really cool available third row. Now, it's not a very big third row, but Honestly, it's about the same size back there as the Mercedes-Benz GLE, even though the interior is a little bit narrower. Now, at the moment, there is no AMG 45 version of the GLB. So if you want this level of power and you want crossover-like styling, we have just the GLA. As you'd expect out of a performance vehicle, we have performance tires. These are Continental performance tires, 255 35 R21. These are really big wheels and tires for a vehicle this small, and there's not a lot of cushion, so definitely keep that in mind. On the inside, we have absolutely enormous brakes. This vehicle does have the brake upgrade that's available. Moving to the rear, there's certainly some hot hatch and some small Mercedes crossover styling elements. One really nice touch is that we have amber turn signals in the United States, something that we don't see in too many Mercedes crossovers. A lot of them end up with red LED elements in the back. We have these enormous quad exhausts down here at the bumper, a relatively difficult to clean air splitter down there at the bottom, and a pretty big wing atop the slightly smaller spoiler that you find in the regular GLA. Mercedes cants the rear glass forward a little bit to give this a sportier vibe. We have a power hatch, which is a really nice touch for a vehicle like this, and then we have a chromed scuff plate right there on top of the bumper. One of the likely reasons that Mercedes has four entry-level vehicles is that this vehicle shares very little with the rest of the Mercedes lineup, excluding the closely related A-Class, CLA, and GLB. This is based around a two-liter four-cylinder turbo engine sitting transversely across the engine bay, very different from every other Mercedes on sale in the U.S. There are three different engine tunes available. The base model gets a two-liter four-cylinder turbo producing 221 horsepower. If you get the GLA 35, that gets you 302 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque. If you get the 45 version, we get a whopping 382 horsepower and 354 pound-feet of torque. Outside the United States, there is another variant of this engine, again, that produces over 400 horsepower, but we don't get that at the moment here. Although some of the close cousins of the GLA still use the older 7-speed dual-clutch transmission, all variants of the GLA use the newer 8-speed DCT, which is definitely smoother. The base engine is available with front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Both AMGs have standard all-wheel drive, and this AMG 45 has another trick up its sleeve 
a torque vectoring rear axle. It has a twin clutch unit in the rear and it can send 100% of the engine torque destined for the rear axle to a single rear wheel. Now this is a little bit different than Acura's super handling all wheel drive because it does not appear that Mercedes is overdriving the rear axle. So the gear ratios on the front axle and the rear axle are identical in this system. Everything put together, this should get 0 to 60 in 4.3 seconds and still give you 23 miles per gallon. The Formatic badge on the front fender is an easy way to differentiate the GLA 35 from the GLA 45. Formatic Plus means this has the torque vector in your axle. Regular Formatic does not. Before we continue, I should talk a little bit about the price tag. Obviously, I'm going to take a deeper dive into pricing later in the video. The GLA 45 may start under $55,000, but start is the important word to keep in mind. This model, as you're looking at right now next to me, is over $70,000. It has $15,880 of options and then a $1,050 destination charge on it. The wheels on this model are over $2,000. This also has the Dynamic Plus package for over $2,000. That gets us the upgraded brakes and a drift mode, which is really cool. We then have the Active Safety package for $1,700, the Recaro seats on the inside for $2,770, and the Aero package on this model is an extra $1,550. That's an option that I think I would skip. Then there are a ton of options on this vehicle that are each under $1,000 that I'm not going to mention, but everything put together gives this a window sticker price of over $71,000. That means this is definitely within the price range of a Mercedes-Benz C-Class AMG or a GLC AMG or a wide variety of different Mercedes models with or without the optional AMG engine packages. The big reason you might want to get the GLB over the GLA is cargo capacity. Behind this hatch, we find 15.4 cubic feet of that, and in the GLB, you can get up to 24 cubic feet, and you, of course, get that third row option as well. As far as comparisons go, this is easily the smallest in this segment. The Range Rover Evoque will give you 21.5 cubic feet, and I always thought that was kind of a small cargo area. There is enough room for 22 inch roller bags to sit in this position and still close the hatch, but that's as far in as they can go. If I lift up the load floor, there's a bit of additional storage space under here. This is where we find the can of fix a flat, no spare tire, and the vehicle subwoofer. There's also a little bit of additional storage space, and you can put the load floor in a lower position to really maximize your cargo capacity. The GLA's driving position is definitely more crossover-like than hatchback or sedan-like. We have basically the same sort of driving position here that we find in the GLB. This driver's seat is a multi-way adjustable Recaro seat. I don't find this seat as comfortable as the base seats in the GLA, I have to say. There's no adjustable lumbar support in the seat design, but we do get a three-position memory over there on the driver's door and a three-position memory on the passenger door. The steering column is a tilt telescopic design with a decent range of motion. If I were shopping for a GLA, even in the sporty variant, I think I would just stick with the base Mercedes seats. Jumping into the back, we find the miracle of the hatchback profile and the transverse engine design. There is a ton of room in the GLA, even though this is not a terribly big vehicle. We have 79 inches of combined legroom, making this one of the roomiest small crossovers in the US. This trails the Cadillac XT4, which is definitely big for this segment, by just 9 tenths of an inch. And you'll find 4 inches more legroom in here than you'll find in a Jaguar E-Pace. That means that even with this front seat comfortably adjusted for a 6 foot 5 person, I have about half an inch of legroom left. I also have a reasonable amount of headroom. This model does not have a moonroof, but I have about an inch of headroom left. If you're looking at something like the A-Class or the CLA and you want something that's a bit more practical for rear-facing child seats or adults or just bigger people in general, you might want to take a look at the GLA. But bear in mind that this is still a subcompact vehicle. So if I sit here in the middle seat, I do have a decent amount of headroom, about half an inch left, and I could put this headrest up and be relatively comfortable back here as long as there was no one sitting next to me. This rear bench seat is not terribly wide. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that this does have over $15,000 of options on it, but this is not completely loaded, so there are actually a few more things that you could get that this model does not have. The driver and front passenger have height adjustable shoulder belts. Four out of the five seat belts are red. The one in the middle in the back is still black. We have fixed height headrests on the driver and front passenger seats. Again, these are the available Recaro seats. We have a AMG logo right there in the middle of that seat back. And you can see that this seat is a blend of leather and suede-like upholstery right there in the middle. There's also a 
ton of red accenting in here. So we have a big stripe of red leather running right down the seat, red stitching here and there and everywhere on the doors, on the seat bottom cushion, on the back cushion. Speaking of the seat back, you can see how aggressive the bolstering is there. If you're much wider than I am, you might find these seats a little bit uncomfortable, but I do appreciate the fact that the shoulder area is nice and wide. So I didn't have any problem with my shoulders there. We have an extendable thigh cushion down there on the seat bottom cushion, decent amount of bolstering down there as well. A lot of soft touch materials going on on the front door panels. There are a bunch of different trim options you can get in the GLA depending on the version that you get and of course how much you're willing to spend for extra trim options. You can see the three position seat memory over there for the front passenger. There's also a heated seat button but no ventilated seats in this model. On the passenger side, we have a moderately sized bin style glove compartment. I was able to fit a larger tablet computer inside. There's also a small shelf up there where you can keep your instruction manual. The interior design of the A-Class, the CLA, the GLA, and the GLB is very similar, but not identical. So they're not simply scale model versions of one another. In the dashboard, we have a distinctive Mercedes dual LCD setup. So one LCD for the instrument cluster, and then another large LCD for the infotainment system. This supports smartphone integration, but as you can see, it doesn't use the entire screen. So the actual screen stretches from the home button over here, all the way down there to that 70 degree icon on the lower right-hand side. We have three large air vents, and then the controls for the dual zone automatic climate control. Continuing down the dashboard, we find a large area where you can keep those larger smartphones. My large smartphone just barely fits in there. We find one USB interface port for the infotainment system. This is a USB-C port, so if you're gonna use other cables, you'd have to use that little Mercedes adapter, or you can find your own adapter, obviously. We have two large cup holders there, definitely suitable for large American takeout drinks. This is the controller for the infotainment system. You can either use this, you can use the controller on the steering wheel, or you can just touch the screen. We then have a ton of different buttons around this. This is the drive mode selector. You choose your basic drive mode there. We then have a button to take you over to the car menu in the infotainment system. It also has some quick access functionality so you can turn on and off the steering assistant and lane keeping system. Some direct access buttons for the infotainment system over there. And then behind this little wrist rest, you can see we have a few other options. There's an exhaust valve open close button, modes for the suspension right there, a manual mode on off for the transmission, and then a button to turn on and off the sport handling mode. Between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest that opens in a bifold fashion and reveals a fairly small storage compartment. I was not able to fit a half gallon of milk in there. On the driver's side, we have a highly configurable LCD cluster. I'm not gonna go over all the features and functions because it would simply take too long. That LCD is controlled via this little controller over here on the steering wheel. It's sort of like the little control nub on a 1990s Blackberry. And then this one is used to control the infotainment system on the right. So you can use this, the touch screen, and that touch controller I showed you earlier. On the right side of the steering wheel, we have some infotainment buttons along with a voice command button. And then on the left side of the steering wheel, we have the cruise control buttons. We then have some configurable buttons below. If I click on the LCD in these sections, I can change what the button does through these options right here. And then I enable and disable the option using the buttons at the end. On the other side of the steering wheel, we have the drive mode button. You can run through all the various drive modes there, or you can click it to get the individual drive mode. Obviously, the best way to describe the GLA is that this is completely bonkers. If you use the race start mode, which involves coming to a complete stop, being in the right drive modes, and then just sort of putting your foot on the brake pedal, letting go of the accelerator pedal, acceleration is definitely very, very good. With that on, I went zero to 60 in 4.1 seconds. That is just a hair faster than Mercedes says this vehicle will go. If however, like most folks, you're just driving around in one of your favorite drive modes, say it's sport or say it's comfort or whatever your particular drive mode preference is, and then we come to a complete stop, doesn't matter whether we're on a corner here, et cetera, because this is all wheel drive and has some seriously grippy tires, and I floor it now, then it's not as aggressive. It takes a while for the dual clutch automatic transmission to do its work. And of course, we have a little bit of time for the turbos to spool up as well. If you're not using the race start, then zero to 60 takes about four tenths of a second longer. I measured that at 4.5 seconds. That's just being in any of the regular drive modes with auto start, stop disabled, moving your foot from the brake pedal on over to the accelerator pedal. That means that if you're taking a look at this versus something like an AMG variant of the GLC, Keep in mind that the difference between using launch control effectively and not in the rest of the Mercedes AMG lineup, excluding their transverse engine vehicles like this, it's actually gonna be quite a bit smaller. And that's because they're using traditional automatic transmissions and dual clutch transmissions definitely have a different dynamic to them, a different feel. The transmission has a very direct feel, however. So if you're interested in that kind of bobbleheaded feel, you can feel the very direct nature of this drivetrain because 
it is a manual transmission at its heart. It's just being shifted by the robot. In my 60 to zero braking test, it took just 105 feet for this vehicle to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. This is an incredible machine. It goes really fast zero to 60, and it stops really quickly from 60 miles an hour back to zero. And the handling is definitely epic as well, as is the handling feel. Long story short, all the numbers in the GLA 45 are epic. It goes quick zero to 60, it stops very quickly from 60 miles an hour back to zero, and it handles like it's on rails. Actually, that's probably inaccurate. It handles better than being on rails because the torque vectoring functionality in the rear combined with the rest of the Mercedes software program in the GLA make this vehicle just behave differently than you'd expect a front power biased vehicle with all wheel drive to be. In most drive modes, this vehicle is incapable of sending more than 50% of engine power to the rear axle. But with that 50% of power to the rear axle, it really does the most of things and it will go around corners like you absolutely would not believe. If you're entering a corner and you're thinking to yourself, I might not make it out of it, you can just add a little bit of extra throttle and that twin clutch rear drive axle just helps you go around the corner better than you ever thought you could. As with some other torque vectoring systems, it takes a little while to get used to this system because the steering is so direct and so precise when using that torque vectoring rear axle in the corners, you may find yourself just overturning the steering wheel a little bit in preparation for what you assume is gonna be understeer and it's actually not. You actually end up going exactly around the corner as you want. When it comes to handling, I am definitely gonna give this an A+. This doesn't have the same kind of driving dynamics that you'd find in a rear-wheel drive Mercedes-Benz GLC or a BMW X3 or anything that's rear-wheel drive that's in this same $55,000 to $70,000 price range. But that's not to say that the driving dynamics are worse. They're just different. This is one of those rare occasions where you can have an engine sitting, what some would say, the wrong way across an engine bay, but still be an absolute blast to drive. The version of the GLA that I'm driving is one of the more hardcore variants. Your experience will vary based on the options you select and, of course, based on the wheels and tires that you end up getting on your GLA. Back out here on the paved road, you will definitely feel all of the small imperfections in this pavement, especially if the vehicle is in its firmest suspension modes. So when it comes to the ride quality, obviously I'm going to have to give this a really low score. Let's go with perhaps D. The ride is definitely very well polished in the sense that the suspension does not get upset over broken pavement. You don't find it skittering across surfaces like you can find in some vehicles, but you will certainly feel all of those pebbles and potholes and just every little crack in the pavement is going to come through. And to be honest, I suspect it's further amplified by the Recaro seats that I happen to be sitting in. The other thing you should know is that this cabin is not terribly quiet. At 50 miles an hour on my usual road test surface, I recorded 74 decibels. Bear in mind that this vehicle does have 255 with tires on it, so these tires are generating more road noise than the base version of the GLA. Definitely keep that in mind. And of course, we have very similar kinds of sound deadening in here, so just more of it ends up in the cabin. Wind noise is very well controlled, but road noise, that's a little bit louder than I would like. On the other hand, fuel economy is definitely excellent. I've been averaging 25 and a half miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving and this is a very very easy vehicle to live with that's one of the real benefits to this particular setup in the Mercedes lineup is that it's a ton of fun it's relatively easy to drive it doesn't have that less predictable rear-wheel drive nature that you'd find in a pure rear-wheel drive vehicle and it's really easy to live with. The suspension tune, yeah, it's a little bit firm, but I can always put this in the comfort mode and I could probably deal with it if I needed to. It's certainly gonna be an awful lot easier to deal with than something that doesn't have an adaptive suspension system. And just, this is just an absolute blast to drive. For 2021, the GLA 45 started at $54,500, but if you get carried away with options, it gets pretty darn expensive, so keep that in mind. If you want the less crazy version, that would be the GLA 35, that will start at $47,550, and if you want the most pedestrian version of the GLA, that would be the GLA 250, starting at $36,230. So you'll notice that the GLA 45 is quite a bit more than the base GLA 250, and the price tag will get up to over double the absolute base model if you choose all 
all of the options on your GLA-45. But I don't find that to be too much of a problem because, honestly, this is a little bit unlike anything else that's available in this group right now. Let's be honest, the GLA really is more of a hot hatch than it is a crossover. The small crossover, I would argue, in the Mercedes lineup is the GLB. That is the one that's more practical, it's boxier, it has an available third row, it's a really great value on its own. But the GLA is a little bit different. It's designed to be sportier, a little bit more style forward, a little bit younger focused perhaps. And that's why we find the 45 tune of the AMG engine under the hood, and we don't find that yet in the GLB. Bearing that hot hatchiness in mind, I think that the most direct competitor in some ways would be the Volkswagen. Golf R. The Golf R is probably going to start over $40,000, although Volkswagen hasn't released pricing just yet, and it looks like we're going to get the same 315 horsepower four-cylinder engine that we find in Europe. Now, the odd part about this is that in reality, that is the hot hatch, of course, but it's not exactly GLA 45 level. It's really more GLA 35. So even though the Golf R is going to be a ton of fun and it may be a value alternative to the GLA 35, there's still no GLA 45 corollary. Now let's take a look at some of the other European options here. We have the BMW X2. It definitely is more style forward like the BMW X1. You can say that the GLA is to the X2 as the X1 is to the GLB perhaps. The X1 and X2 are related. X2 is the more style forward option. But BMW is not being quite as crazy or insane with their power output figures. There is an M Performance model that will get up to 301 horsepower, but there is absolutely no corollary to the GLA 45. And remember, of course, that in Europe you can get an even more aggressive tune of the GLA. So remember that you could probably buy some of those aftermarket performance options designed for Europe and just go ahead and put them on your GLA in America. Also from Europe, we have the Audi RS Q3, which is the absolutely bonkers small crossover from Audi, 400 horsepower out of a two and a half liter four cylinder engine. Unfortunately, we're not going to be getting it in the United States. We're also not going to be getting a hatchback variant of the A3, it appears. Now, Audi has said we are going to be getting a sedan A3, and it's likely we'll be getting an RS3 sedan at some point, but that would really be more of a competitor to the A-Class or the CLA inside the Mercedes lineup, not the one that we're taking a look at today. In many ways, I think the most direct competition for the GLA 45 is entirely within the Mercedes envelope in the form of the AMG variants of the GLC. The GLC is quite a different vehicle. It's rear wheel drive, of course, although by the time we're taking a look at the AMG models, all wheel drive is standard, but it's always gonna send more power to the rear axle than the GLC can. On the other hand, that doesn't necessarily make it more fun. The GLA is an absolute blast to drive. It drives like it's on rails. The torque vectoring rear axle is absolutely incredible. The solid shifting nature of the dual clutch transmission is incredible as well. On the GLC, we have a bit more of a traditional layout. We have a traditional automatic transmission, although the GLC 63 gets some important tweaks to that automatic transmission internally it is still a nine speed automatic. It also is bigger, it's a little bit heavier, and it feels a little bit more grown up than the GLA 45. So depending on what you're looking for, definitely keep that in mind. Now, price wise, the GLA 45 can get up to about $75,000. That is oddly within the price range of the GLC 63 and the GLC 43. The GLC 43 starts at 59,009, goes zero to 60 in 4.7 seconds. So a little bit slower than the GLA 45. The GLC 63 is notably faster at 3.8 seconds and it is $73,900 starting. Now these are starting prices. Obviously the GLC 63 will get much more expensive than the GLA 45. But if you were willing to trade some of those nicer creature comforts in the top end GLA 45 or the additional styling wheel options, et cetera, that get you up to $75,000, you could get better performance in the GLC. One thing you won't find in the GLC, however, oddly enough, is more legroom. We actually find a little bit more in the GLA. We do have about four cubic feet more cargo space in the GLC, but on the inside, these two vehicles are oddly similar in size. And that is entirely due to the transverse engine layout that we find in the GLA. That particular design is simply more space efficient than having a longitudinal engine, designing your vehicle for a big V8 engine to live under the hood. You can really shorten up the dimensions, take 10 inches off the outside of the vehicle, and still somehow have an interior that is almost identical in size. The GLA will give you better fuel economy thanks to its general design, but overall it's going to feel a little less refined than the GLC. If I were shopping for a small Mercedes performance crossover, I have to admit I would be really torn between the GLA 45 and the GLC 43. The GLC 43 is going to feel a little bit more grown up, a little bit more refined. There are going to be some additional features that you can get in the GLC, and I think its cabin is a little better appointed than the GLA. But honestly and oddly, 
the GLA, I think, is just a little bit more fun. It has more personality, a bit more soul. You would expect the GLC to do the things that it can do based on its general design, but you'll be really surprised at what you can do in a GLA 45. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section, and what would you pick if you were shopping in this enormous price range that we find in this particular Mercedes model. Be sure and find me over at facebook.com slash Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all those other social things, and I'll see all of you later.